Welcome back to The Dad Chronicle, where we share stories from dads all around the world. I'm your host, Alex Alvisu. This is episode 106. On today's episode, I speak with a listener of the show who wrote in. It's Daniel Camarillo. Daniel is a stepfather of two children, but also he is a board-certified behavior analyst. He works with autistic kids every day. So we start out the conversation by really learning about what a BCBA is. Really what we're concerned with is what is their motivation to do whatever it is you want to do, and then how can you manipulate what's happening around that to kind of come to a better solution? Next, we talk about some of the ways that you can work with your autistic child at home if you don't have immediate support. Once they're motivated for things and you know what they want, then you can work on everything else. And finally, we talk about the impact of telehealth on in-home child care. I had heard on a podcast, you know, an ABA podcast, that they were talking about telehealth as like this thing that would be really nice, but there's it's not really well studied. Nobody really gets to use it. And then COVID happened. And then it's like, okay, well, we all got to figure it out somehow. Here's my conversation with Daniel Camarillo. Daniel Camarillo, welcome to the Dad Chronicle. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Oh, not too bad, man. Thanks for chatting with me on this uh, this Saturday evening that we decided to sit down and chat. You're a listener of the Dad Chronicle, and you uh, you reached out with some really great um, feedback about just what it's like being a BCBA. We'll get into some of that, but not only that, you're also a stepdad. So I wanted to bring you on the show and and give you an opportunity to kind of share some of the details that you sent me in an email. So thank you so much for reaching out first and foremost. And uh, why don't you take a moment to just introduce yourself to the world? All right. Well, I'm Daniel. I'm uh, married to Priscilla. I have two kids, Fiona and Thomas. They're 19 and 17. I am a board-certified behavior analyst. Um, What that means is that I usually work – I'm working in the autism field, so I work with autistic kids. Um, COVID is kind of – taken everything for a unique spin and we've kind of had to figure out how to still provide help to families that are dealing with COVID and then also having their kids and just, you know, everybody's working from home and just what that all looks like. Yeah. That, and that's, that's, there's a lot of challenge there. Um, certainly on, on a bunch of different levels. And, uh, we're definitely going to jump into some of that for the folks at home there. There have been folks in the DAC Chronicle community on Facebook who have mentioned that this is really a topic that they wanted to learn more about. So I'm really happy to be chatting with you. Um, and before we really jump into some of that, um, let's talk about your experience as a stepdad, uh, introduce us to, uh, your, your, uh, step kids and like how you met them. Okay. So, um, I've, I've got two kids, uh, Fiona and Thomas. Fiona's 19. She's in community college right now. And then Thomas is 17. He just finished his junior year of high school and he'll be starting senior year. Um, they, I met them uh, pretty early on, actually. I, I knew Priscilla as a friend for a long time before we actually got together. Uh, and Fiona was uh, 11 and Thomas was nine when we actually uh, got together. And then we got married a couple of years after that. Um, so I've kind of known them in passing here and there throughout their whole lives, but I didn't really become a part of their life until they were already in that preteen, almost preteen age. Yeah. And that's actually, that's a really interesting time. Um, what was it like getting to know them as their, and, and eventually becoming their stepdad? Was that tough for you? Uh, I mean, I always took the kids that I, the way I kind of approach parenting is, I, you know, there's no guidebook, for, unfortunately. I didn't really know what to do. So I just let them kind of come to me at their own pace. It was easy with Tom when he was younger because he was really into video games. And so that was a definite in for me. Oh, yeah. Uh, Fiona was a little bit more more of a challenge because she wasn't really into video games. But um, actually, over the years, I've, go, I've grown probably closer to Fiona than Thomas. Uh, Thomas has just hit that teenager phrase where, you know, I, I remember going through that when I was his age, too. So oh, yeah. he just doesn't like authority, doesn't, you know, not a big fan of school and I, I totally get it. But so we're, we're button heads a little bit now, but, um, it's, it's still, we, we make things work for sure. You know, relating to kids at that level, um, at that age, really, uh, about some of the challenges that they're going through just from puberty to, uh, you know, that adolescence and, and kind of growing into that adult that you're trying to be, um, that's, that's gotta be kind of challenging as a stepfather. Um, what are some of the ways that you're trying to bring understanding? Like, how are you reminding yourself that, uh, perhaps you were like that at one age is th- how, how would folks at home hear this and maybe be able to apply that if they're experiencing something similarly? 
I mean, uh, as as a teenager, I wasn't really. I, I can look back and say that I wasn't really always the best kid to my parents. You know, I, I had a little bit of an attitude too. So uh, I think that in those moments when I find myself getting frustrated, it's important to kind of think about, oh, well, I was kind of a snot too. So it's important to take a step back, take a breath. Like I, I try not to bring work home, but I definitely apply some of the basic principles. It's like, okay, well, it doesn't help to react when you're mad because it's not going to get anywhere. Everybody's mad. Nobody's, nobody's hearing anything. Um, so I like to take a step back and just think things through and figure out what What's the end result that I'm trying to get? Um, what am I trying to teach? What am I trying to kind of make sure? Because it's it's all about communication at this point. We're all a cohesive unit. We're all trying to live in the same house and you know be do the best we can. And I think that that's keeping that in mind and then kind of striving towards that, figuring out. I, I'm big on making plans and kind of trying those things out. It hasn't always been successful, but um, I've always tried for the most part, to be level-headed. <laughs> yeah, good on you, man. You're putting your best foot forward there. And uh, that's funny that you kind of went there. I was going to ask you, when, when have you brought some of the, you know, the little tricks in your in your bag of tricks learned uh, from work? Like, when have you been able to apply that? And that's probably a good segue into this topic of what ABA is and, and BCBA. People are hearing, like, a lot of acronyms right now. Um, it, it's probably worth diving into that topic now. Can you uh, define ABA? Uh, so we'll define it. So ABA is applied behavior analysis. Um, it's very simple, really. Uh, if you kind of take a historical viewpoint, it goes back to earlier things of, you know, people think of behaviorism when they think of ABA, which isn't, it isn't a fair shake. It's, it's, there's some elements of it that are right, but others that are not essentially what we're doing. And it's not that, so I have to start by saying, it's not that we think that people don't have free thoughts and free will, because we definitely do. It's more that it's really hard to know what people are thinking. So we just look at what they're actually doing. So we're looking at the behaviors that they're doing uh, to kind of figure out what is motivating them. And really what we're concerned with is what is what is their motivation to do whatever it is you want to do? And then how can you manipulate what's happening around that to kind of come to a better solution? So if you're, you know, if you're hitting somebody um, because you want to get somebody's attention, the little kids do this all the time. They come run up and smack you in the leg. And it's like they, they know that that works, right, um, as opposed to just tugging on your leg because maybe you're cooking dinner and you're just not paying attention. And so they might start – I've seen this happen and they'll start by tugging on your leg. It doesn't get a reaction. Tug on your leg, tug on your leg. It doesn't work and so then they punch you in the leg. And then you're like, ow, what? And then you look down um, and that – from work's perspective, you're essentially just teaching them, oh, well, I should just hit people to get what I want, right? Yeah, so yeah. it doesn't always work that way, but it's it's definitely um, – we're looking at the consequence of that behavior, right, was that you turned and looked when you got punched. So the behavior was you got punched, and then the antecedent was they were trying to get your attention. They couldn't get it. So um, we're yeah. looking at what the reason is for whatever we do and then – using what was happening right before and right afterwards to kind of change what's going on to be a better pattern, right? So if they're kind of tugging on your leg and then you want to make sure you're, look, you're responding to that, if you're trying to teach a kid to talk, you want to try to have them like sit, try to say some, you know, to say hey or something just so that you can then respond to that instead of whatever it is, behavior that they're doing now that may or may not be what you want to see in the end. Yeah, you know, what you're saying is really profound because there's so much that happens as a parent that you should be aware of like your own behavior, right? Like oh, and yeah. that that's influencing how your child responds or uh, initiates their behavior in the first place, which I think is, is a really important thing to keep in mind. You know, I don't know if you're, are you familiar with like the Hawthorne effect and what that um, is? Um, it sounds familiar, but I can't. So this is something I, I, this is, you know, like one of my few takeaways from, from college. I'm just kidding, kids. Go to college. It's great. College is great. So, but one of the <laughs> things that I remember from college in taking a psych class was the Hawthorne effect. You know, it's basically when you realize, like, you know that you're being um, part of a test or a subject of an experiment. So you may skew the the results because you, you just have a bias, essentially. Um mm -hmm. So whenever you're working with, you know, your maybe working is not the right word, but interacting with your stepkids, it, does that ever come into play? Like, are your stepkids like, oh, he's analyzing me again? Like, is it anything like that? So I've been accused of that by everybody in the house. <laughs> so um, 
I, I don't always do it. I, I, sometimes I do it subconsciously. But to me, what's helpful is to think about, okay, well, if, if somebody's doing something and it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, then they must have a reason for doing it that I'm just not thinking of. So basically trying to break it down and be like, okay, well, um, and then how can we then change that if that's, if, if that's what we want to do? So if, you know, if one of the kids doesn't want to do, do the dishes, how can we motivate them to do the dishes? Or, you know, to me, it's over you, – because you see behavior over time. It's a pretty consistent pattern, won't want to do dishes. So then let's – to me, it's it's a clear sign that they don't they just don't want to do it. They're trying to get out of it in any way, shape, or form possible. So then, what can we do to change that so that it becomes more likely to happen? So that's yeah, and that's uh, I, I I could see how that's challenging, especially as a step parent in that situation. Maybe the dynamic with you know, no matter how great of a relationship you have with uh, a child, um, uh, you know, knowing that. Uh, like I talked to Scott Johnson's sister, Wendy, um, her, she's even told me like, you know, it's tough being the parent, uh, and you know, you're a psychologist when, or a therapist when, you know, you're, you're talking to your own kids and they're like, stop doing it, mom. You know what I mean? Um, so there's gotta be some challenge there. And, uh, but, but I, I appreciate your, your point of view on this because there's a very steadiness and a calmness to your approach, which I think is really inspiring from, you know, from my perspective, because it's so easy to fly off the handle and just, and just, uh, you know, really like ream your kid about, Hey, do this thing that I keep telling you to do. But at the end of the day, really what it all comes down to is observing your behavior as a parent so that you don't influence and exacerbate that, that issue, uh, to begin with. So I think that's really important. One, I think it's important to also keep in mind that I, I said that those things, when we're working with kids, it's, it's you know, we're looking at this behavior chain of what's going on. We have those things too. We're not, oh, yeah. nobody's like exempt from that. We have our own motivations and our own reasons for doing things. So right. we're frustrated. So then we start yelling and that, that doesn't get you anywhere. No, no, it doesn't. And it's so easy. It might easy make to... you feel a little better, which oh, then no. reinforces it and causes you to do it more. But in the end, you're not getting the result you want. So. Yeah, it's so easy to fly off the handle sometimes. Like I think about some of the stuff that that my three year old does, and I just and, and you know sometimes she just doesn't listen, and you know the way you react, and uh, sometimes she just keeps asking for the same thing over and over and over and over, and you're like, no, 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 and and but sometimes it's also some poking and prodding, and she knows that she can get her way sometimes, and so it's you're right, it's being very aware. It's it's like the. It, uh, the way I would I talk to parents is like the slot machine, right? So if if she keeps poking and poking and poking and poking and sometimes it works, then she's just going to poke at least that long next time. So you either have to be firm, put your foot down, figure out what, you know, give the clear answer of like, you can't have this now, this is when you can have it, and then follow through with it. And it's terrible in the moment. You, but she's you, so you, cute, Daniel. Oh, she's I know. She's so cute. I want to give Baby's... her everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then... Or do you want to teach her to poke the bear? You want to teach her to ask for it. And, You're right. You're yeah, right. it's it's tough. It's tough. <laughs> well, let's let's shift to the definition of BCBA. So so you are a board certified behavior analyst. Uh, what went into that training for you? Uh, so I actually started out as what they would call a behavior technician before there was even the term technician. Um, which basically I worked with kids on the spectrum. Somebody else above me kind of gave me. Uh, whatever plan they were planning to implement for whatever goals they were working on for the kid. I did that for a long time. Uh, and then eventually I was like, you know what? I can't do this forever. I loved being a therapist, uh, but I couldn't, I knew that eventually age was going to catch up to me. So I went back to school. Um, so a BCBA is essentially a master's level um, person. I think now there's, I think, three different degrees you can get that will qualify. And then you have to take six courses um, for the BCBA exam. And then you take an exam. It's almost like a uh, speech or OT, and it's a master's level position. Um, so you take this test. It's really scary. When I took the test, and this is my old man coming out on me, which is, it hasn't been that long since I took the test, but COVID kind of made a lot of changes. When I took the test, I took it in um, August, and they wouldn't you – you take the test. You have to go into a testing center. You have to drop all your stuff off. You have to basically get fingerprinted and – there's cameras everywhere, and so if you have oh any God. concerns about taking a test, this is not helping. Oh my God! Um, 
there's limited tests. So I actually, I drove, I think, four or five hours to the testing center to take the test. And then I didn't find out whether I passed or didn't pass for three months. <laughs> Dude. So uh, yeah. what are they, I guess, does it just take that long? So what they're doing is they're looking at your results and comparing it to, because they have different tests essentially. And they're just, they were measuring the metrics against what everybody else is doing. And it just, it took a long time for them to decide whether or not it was, you know, enough to be considered a BCBA. Now you take the test, you find out when you're there. That's, that has actually happened since March. Wow. (laughs) So. (laughs) Dude, you should have just waited. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, seriously, like that's, that's gotta be really, really, uh, stressful. And I, it kind of put it in a different perspective for me. This is more than, it sounds like this is more than just, did you get ABC, you know, like, uh, like the Scantrons, like this is more than just a Scantron. They're taking context into, into account with your answers and comparing it across the board. Right. Yes. I think it's like 160 questions or something like that. And there's a lot of ethical questions, essentially, Uh, what they want is they want people who are very ethical that are th- going to think what's best for whoever you're working for. Um, whether you're working for a family, you're working for a kid, you're working in a school district or, you know, cause, uh, BCBA can work in gerontology or they can work, um, in for a business to kind of help promote people to be more motivated to get things done. So what they're looking for is to see whether you're ethical, whether you understand all the principles that go into that and you can apply them all. So the questions are a lot of the questions are deliberately misleading um, because they want you to make sure you're reading the question and then kind of looking for the right answer. Not only that is an answer that works, but then the best answer, because there might be two or three that are exactly that, you know, one word difference or slight differences. And you have to think about the context of the question. So yeah. the test was, I, I was lucky. I mean, I passed yeah. the first time, um, but there's definitely a lot of people who don't pass the first time. I mean, I could imagine like just hearing the the way that they're asking questions and how they're looking for, they're almost setting you up for little traps like that. I, I'm curious, what inspired you to get into this line of work? Uh, honestly, I was living in Kentucky and I moved uh, back to the Bay Area after having been there. And I was looking for any job, to be honest. And I ended up applying to a bunch of jobs just on Craigslist. And one of them was like working with kids. And I'm like, I'd never really worked with kids before, but I was looking for any job because it was right after the recession. So um, I took the job and then the rest is history because I I think at first the, the initial training is like it doesn't prepare you for what you really are doing. But after a couple of months, I was like, this is amazing. I love this job. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, it sounds like it's just right up your alley with how there's a definite sense of passion with how you're talking about it and the importance of it to you. So I think that, I mean, it sounds to me like you found your calling, which is really, really cool. Um, You know, I'm curious when you're working with like autistic kids in home, what's that dynamic like uh, between you and the kids? Is there trust also with the parents? Is there trust? How do you approach that? I mean, absolutely. I mean, that's that's one of the things that we that I always make sure I, I talk to the families because whenever we're starting services with a kid, the first thing we tell parents is we go over all the minutia of like what it looks like, all the paperwork they're going to have to fill out and just what's going to happen next. But then one of the key points is that, OK, I don't know how long this is going to take for for me or for whoever is going to be working with their kid to build that trust. The rapport is everything. Because if you have built a good relationship with a kid, then you can get them to do the work. If you come in just telling somebody what to do, it's it's as if I were to come over to your place, Alex, and be like, all right, do this, do this, do this, do this. You're going to look at me like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to do anything for you. So it's important to kind of come in and play and figure out what they like and what they what they like to do, what they're interested in, and meet them at their level. It's, it's the most important thing to me. Yeah. Why did you be, uh, decide to focus on autism? Uh, well, again, because I kind of came into the field just by chance, right. I have just been working in the field with autism for a long time. I think over the, the years that I've been doing this, I've seen other, I've worked with kids that have other, you know, developmental disabilities as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not that I don't work with them. It's just autism is kind of the biggest area of gotcha. ABA right now. Gotcha. Yeah. And, you know, thinking about a lot of the the families out there that listen to the show, especially some of the folks that have written in or chimed in on the community on Facebook, um, you know, they've mentioned that they would love to hear some ideas on how to work with their kids during this time. We've had, um, we had our education series, a few, you know, 
episodes ago over the past few months uh, with COVID happening. Um, you know, what sort of tangible things can parents do to work with their autistic kids or, or kids with various disabilities or learning disabilities uh, that could help alleviate perhaps some of the, the angst that they're feeling and um, maybe in the absence of an in-home ABA? Sure. I mean, I think first off, I have to I would have to say that if you're already working with a team, you already have a BCBA on your team, and they've been calling you to try to do telehealth sessions, answer their phone calls, meet with them through telehealth, and because they'll give you some pointers. Even if there's a couple of things that I'm doing these days, um, and it can look anything from because uh, I'm still going into the homes as well, depending on what what uh, what issues are going on with the kid, but. At the most basic level, I'm still meeting with parents to give them some strategies of what to do, or I'm giving them pointers while they're working with their child so that they can kind of keep moving their, towards progress and making sure they're not losing any skills that they've learned. Um, or, you know, in, in some cases, I'm still going into the field with other people and they're kind of working with the kids if they need additional help. But in general, what you can do to kind of help with kids is that, to me, the, the focus, the, the biggest thing you can do is to keep working on that communication skills. So I think that most important thing to do is to work on getting them to ask for stuff. So... Um, it's a wide range. It really depends on the level of, or the age of the kid, kind of their communication levels. Um, so if they're if they're fully verbal, keep them talking because I, I think all of us being trapped at home, we spend a lot of time on our own. We don't really kind of talk to a lot of people. I think just communicating is important just to make sure you keep that skill and you keep doing that. Uh, if they've got limited language, you want to try to make them talk and ask for things. So even if you know what they want, get them to say it. So if they want a Capri Sun, you make them ask for a Capri Sun because at least then they're talking. Uh, if it's a nonverbal child and they, you've, if you've been using, you know, some sort of AAC device or PEX to communicate, keep using that. If you have questions, you can always reach out to your BCBA and get them to like remind to basically go do do a refresher for how to do that. But just keep them talking, keep them asking for things because that's the key to everything else. Once they're motivated for things and you know what they want then you can work on everything else. Yeah, that's interesting. So I think the verbal piece, working with the kids to just keep them talking is one that I guess I didn't really anticipate. Um, that, that's an interesting perspective. What, um, you know, if, if families are listening to this right now, they don't have like an in-home BCBA. How do they know if one is right for them? Is there ever a situation where it's not a good idea? Um, so... Obviously, being a BCPA, it's easy for me to say, like, no, there's always a the right choice. But I think if you, if you're in a situation where, you know, there's just lots of, uh, there's no opportunities for consistency. Because the one thing that ABA does well is consistency. the the more f The more consistent the schedule can be, the better it is for everybody. So if you know, you're working swing shift and it changes every week and you can't ever make it to an appointment and you don't have anybody that can help um, to basically be there to work with your child, um, that's probably not a good fit. Um, and then I think if there's other medical issues that are going to interfere with kind of doing ABA, those, those are really the big things to be a concern about. But otherwise, we, you know, in the field, we, we work with a lot of different situation. So um, even if, you know, Johnny's at one house on Monday and another house on Tuesday and he's in daycare on Wednesday and you want to get him help in all three of those situations, we, we go everywhere and kind of help everybody. It's all about training wow. everybody to be on the same team and working in the same way. Wow. So you would follow the kid. It's not like you're not allowed to go into specific, like, like go to their daycare and work with them. That's a typical thing that you can do. So it, Really, again, because it goes, it falls under the HIPAA guidance. Um, whatever the parents are comfortable with is what we can do. Uh, usually, the only times you run into limitations are if they're in public school. Sometimes the public schools won't let you go in there because they fall under that what's called the IEP process, which is like the school evaluation. Once kids are starting in that pre-K, they'll get evaluated and get help from school. And usually, because help is coming from school, we can't go to their school. Mm. But daycare, you know private preschools, in the home, grandma's house, you know, out in the park, 
we do everything. It's well, just that's that's part of what we're trying to do. Um, going back to your earlier question with a, with ABA, just BCBA, just generally working with kids in the spectrum, is we're trying to have kids that um, can basically be in any environment and they know what to do. I mean, we don't want to force kids to talk, but we want them to make sure that they have the skills to do so. Yeah. See, that's important. Uh, now, I, I want to touch on something that you brought up, um, the public school system. How do you feel public schools are addressing uh, special care for kids with autism or different scales of that spectrum? Uh, do they tr- do they have the right resources in place? Or do you feel like there's different things that need to happen? I mean, without getting too political, I mean, it's it's hard because I think schools... I know a lot of teachers and I know that they do they do amazing work and I couldn't do their job. I mean, I could not work with 12 kids at once. I would just, I can just see my eyes going cross-eyed trying to do it. Um, that being said, I think almost every school would say that they always need more help. They always need more funding, more people, because uh, it's a hard job. I mean, even for me and in, in-home, in we have basically one person working with the kid. We have me me and maybe another person kind of helping to supervise the case, and that's only for one kid. If you've got 12 kids in the classroom, you might have the teacher and two aides. And so you it's hard to really divide your time because everybody needs help. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. The Yeah, I, I typically hear from teachers that there's always something more that they could use help with. I think that's, yeah, certainly without getting too political, but it's important to mention, I mean, you know, schools need funding to be able to handle some of this stuff. Um, I get a sense that, you know, like at the, at, at its core, and this is very evident from all the teachers I've spoken to on this podcast, but they care, they care so much, but it's also clear that there's like, you know, a resource issue in some cases, not all cases, I think, some cases. Cause I've worked in some school, school districts or with some teachers in school districts over the years. And I think that the, the hardest part for everybody involved, and then, then that goes with anybody working with anybody else is that, you have to remember that whoever you're working with, whether that's the BCBA, whether it's the speech, the OT, or the or me with the teacher, everybody wants to help. So we definitely will go into the situation wanting to think, oh, well, I know better than they do. Um, but everybody brings something else to the piece. I mean, that's like even with in-home ABA, one thing I tell parents is that, yes, I might know ABA and I might know the principles that go there, but you know your kid. You know you have all that history with them. You know everything that they like, they don't like, what they used to do, what they, you know, do in their daily routine. We might be there for a couple of hours. In school settings, we might even be only be there for 30 minutes. So the teachers, the the speech, the OT, everybody has a different skill set. And I think it requires everybody to be working together to really make progress. Man, so true. goes right back to that adage that we talk about a lot on this show. It takes a village. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like it really yeah. does. And that's the thing I talked to and Becca, who was a teacher that I spoke with a couple episodes ago, said it as well. Like parents, you know, your kids best, right? Like, and I think that, uh, in 99.9% repeating, uh, of course, you know, situation, there's going to be a parent that wants to do the right thing for their kid. And they're going to stick to their guns and they're going to figure it out and they're going to want to work with the people that, that want to help them. And I think that that's, that's so important to keep in mind that you have to follow your gut as a parent. And, and, you know, I want to, I want to shift a little bit thinking about telehealth for a second. Uh, This is challenging. I I know this from personal experience because Aria had pink eye like a month ago. We had to do the telehealth thing where we talked to the, the doctor over the, over the video and very helpful, very like, it was like a fine experience. The problem was, is that it was really hard to do any sort of examination because, you know, dealing with a toddler, a three-year-old or whatever, trying to get her <laughs> pinned down. Trying to get her like, to sit down, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> here, let me pry open your eye. Like there's no reasonable, <laughs> there, I, I, I can't expect her to be like, oh yeah, sure. Dad here, dig at my eye. That's probably hurting a lot. And they couldn't really tell what was wrong with her um, because she squirmed a lot. And we had to take her in anyway the next day because it got worse. She's fine now, everybody. It's fine. But like that was a challenging experience. Um, not the best. Again, not for the sake of the doctor not trying their best. How has this been a challenge for you in your situation with this COVID that we're dealing with? 
So, I mean, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. I mean, I, when this, before COVID, the idea of doing telehealth in ABA was like, oh, that's a pipe dream. It's never really going to happen um, because insurance, insurances never really would fund it before. So there wasn't really a lot of experience. Um, I had heard on a podcast, you know, an ABA podcast, that they were talking about telehealth as like this thing that would be really nice, but there's, it's not really well studied. Nobody really gets to use it. And then COVID happened. And then it's like, okay, well, we all got to figure it out somehow. Um, I think the hardest part has been, okay, well, how how can we do anything because it's it's not even about like day to day for me is we have a six month plan where we have all these skills we're trying to teach covid happened it's like okay well we're going to ignore that completely because we just some of those things we just can't do it's just impossible so let's figure out what we can do and then work on that so you're basically just focusing on it so it's a real conversation so with the families that I do work with. It's like, okay, well, realistically, how much time do you have to work with your kid? And know that there's no judgment. I understand people have to work. And, you know, some people still have to go, you know, the essential workers still have to go to work. People are working from home. They're trying to figure out how to do their own telehealth issues. So from there, you have a better idea of how much time they have to spend. Okay, well, this is what I think we should be working on. This is what I think the focus is. And then asking the parents, like, okay, is there something bigger? Is there something else that you think is more important right now? And then figuring out what those skills are that we're going to focus on because we can't work on everything right now. And then working on just those things and then kind of walking them through that. So for the families I would meet with just doing a parent meeting, we would talk about, okay, this is how I would do it. Okay, now here's what you do in this situation and that a situation. And then if they want to, we can try it with their child and just see if we can get it to – so that I can give them pointers about how what they could try to do what they did right, what they did wrong, what they can try to, you know, basically just make it more streamlined. Are the parents pretty easy to work with in these situations with this telehealth? Are you finding them to be patient or is it pretty tough? Uh, well, honestly, since since this all started, parents have more patient now than they used to be. I used to basically have to try to find, um, because every, I, I live in Silicon Valley. So in the Bay Area, everybody's busy. Everybody's trying to, they always have a million things they have to deal with. So it's always hard to get a parent to just sit down and meet. So I would I would struggle to try to get them to do parent training because we're, we're supposed to try to get them to do it monthly. And it's, it's usually a challenge to get families to sit down and do that. Usually I basically do it when I'm hanging out with their kid, giving supervision to the other staff, and then talk to them briefly about it. Um, but the families that are receiving those services, um, at least to this point, because there's there's some that have decided not to. They basically just are putting things on place. But every family that I'm meeting with now, whether they were a family that was already completely on board and just doing everything they could, or they were someone who was new, they've all jumped in feet first. Like let's and it's it's amazing. Parents have done a great job with their kids. What would you tell parents out there? Maybe some words of wisdom. This is the way I always like to end the show is just kind of thinking about words of wisdom, like. What would you tell them if they're struggling in this situation right now with uh, with their child who's wherever they are on the spectrum um, and, and perhaps how they can leverage some of the help that perhaps you bring? So I think one thing, one piece of advice I've given a lot is that, okay, let's think about where you were a year ago, two years ago with your child. Like what were the skills that you were working on then? What were your concerns then? Let's think about where you are right now. Remember that progress that you made, because I think it's important to think about all that, all the gains, all the things that you've done over the last year to kind of make that progress and be successful with your child. And then what can you do now? Just remember, everybody has limits. I know it's important to spend as much time as you have with your kids, especially now that we're home, but you also have to give time for yourself too. You can't be working all the time. Because I know that burnout is a big thing for parents. You have to take that time for yourself. And it's okay because you are doing the best you can. And that's what we can do. God, well said. Because And, and this goes back to the past several episodes that we've heard uh, leading up to this, especially with COVID really being kind of top of mind. Um, we all deserve a little grace. Let's remember the wins. Uh, we all need to get cut ourselves some slack. We need to cut others some slack, too. We need to make sure that we are remembering uh, that everybody's dealing with a lot of hardships right now in a lot of variety of different ways. And uh, Absolutely. that, dude, and that very, very well said. And reach out. I mean, 
everybody in your household, they're all part of the team. So if you need a break, you can have somebody else come help too. I know that um, with everybody being home, other siblings can sometimes be help. Sometimes, you know, parents can kind of tag team. Okay, your turn for 30 minutes. I got to go jump on a call. <laughs> yeah. So it's important yeah. to kind of use everybody. And remember that it takes everybody. It takes everybody to make it work. Very, very well said. Now, now I want to ask also, like, are there any resources or uh, perhaps like online blogs or groups, communities, anything that you would recommend parents check out on this topic? Oh man, that one I wasn't ready for, Alex. Um, so I, I think that um, the, the best bet is if you're looking for information, I think there's a like a parent's guide to ABA that if you look in Amazon, you can probably find something like that that could basically give you some basic pointers. I think that if you are if you're not already receiving services, reach out to your, you know, your insurance provider and get that stuff started. Because I think even now, like I'm, I'm doing assessment still, so um, there's always time for help. And everybody, you know, even if things are hard and everybody is kind of doing things remotely, there's always the chance to get help. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, I know I didn't ask you to bring any specific resources, but you just gave some. And they, look, there you go. Yeah, that's great. I thought of that like <laughs> like at, towards the end of this. I was like, you know, there should really be something that parents uh, perhaps look into. But there you go. Yeah. Uh, find out from your insurance providers what's possible to bring BCBA into your own home and, and to help out in these situations. Because like you said, uh, it, it, it takes a village and this is a great example of how you can ask for help. And there are great systems in place to help with this. So, um, uh, again, our guest today has been Daniel. Daniel, thank you so much for sharing so much wisdom, man. This was so great. And I learned a lot. So thank you very much for sharing your story. Really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Alex. Nice to be here. Big thanks to Daniel for sharing his story and a lot of great wisdom on how to help your child if they have autism somewhere on that spectrum. I hope this conversation was helpful to you. I know that there are a lot of challenges uh, going on in the world today, but hopefully the type of support and information that you're getting from this show is helpful. And if you'd like to provide any feedback or any thoughts on the conversation today, email the dad chronicle podcast at gmail.com. If you enjoyed what you listened to today, give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and consider supporting this show. If you head over to the dadchronicle.com, there's a link there to become a patron. Find a any dollar value that works well for you, even $1 a month, guys. That helps a lot to uh, support all the production costs that go along with this show. And also, while you're there, you can make sure that you're subscribed to your favorite podcatcher. It's all free. All this content is free. So thank you again to all who support this show. It goes a long way. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time. If you like this show, Check out more great content at incastmedianetwork.com.